The Music is Life podcast has our own merch now over on tpublic.com. Click the link below in the video description. Looking for some new threads? We got t-shirts, long sleeves, hoodies, crew neck sweatshirts, tank tops, baseball tees, and also clothes for kids and onesies for your little infant metalheads. Don't want clothes but love the Java? We got you covered with coffee mugs and travel mugs. Need protection for your electronics? We've also got phone and laptop cases. We've got everything you're looking for at the tpublic.com Music is Life podcast store. Use my link below for fast service. Thanks for your support. TerraNut is proud to offer you a natural nut bar chock full of healthy fats, minerals, and protein that meet your demands. Go to their website, www.terranut.com. You can order from them directly and they will ship it to you. Use my coupon code LUMAVS and you will get a 25% discount on your first order. TerraNut Superfood Snacks, www.terranut.com. Don't forget to use coupon code LUMAVS at checkout. Fuel your life. Looking for some new podcasts to listen to? Well, look no further than the Ratsaw Review Network. Ratsaw Review is taking over the podcast world with plenty of shows to choose from within their network of entertaining programming, including the flagship show, Ratsaw Review, with Wayne Noon, Greg Noggle, and Lou Mavs, as well as occasional co-hosts Manny Mejias and James Lilquist. We also have the official Ratsaw Review spin-off, such as Album vs. Album, Screams from the Grave, where we discuss beloved yet forgotten hard rock and metal albums of the past, and a King Diamond podcast called This Broadcast Belongs to Them. We've also got Old Man Metal's music. The Right Opinion with Harrison Bergeron. Beyond Bushido, a podcast dedicated to pro wrestling and MMA with James Lilquist and Eric Adams. No relation to the guy from Manowar or the mayor of New York City. The Vieira Ball with Ralph Vieira. Schmackamagab! Schmackamagab to you too, Ralph. The Team Otoki podcast featuring Stradivarius and Avalon founding member Team Otoki. The BS Sessions with Mark and Jerry. Just the Cheese, Please, a podcast dedicated to cheesy films of the 1980s with Tara J and Adam. The Friday Night Party with the great Harry Barnett and Evie. And the Music is Live podcast with Lou Mavs. The Ratsaw Review Network is your go-to one-stop shop for the best podcasts out there today. Go to RatsawReview.com for more info. And to find out where you can find, follow, subscribe, and comment on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and all streaming platforms. The Ratsaw Review Network. We're We're taking taking over. Ladies and gentlemen, how do? We are ready and waiting for you now. If it's a fight that you just see, we've acquired our strength through pain. No more are we pathetic game. We do are the reason why we claim that we've all become this way. And I regret this prison that I created for my. Who can it be? Who makes us cry? Won't you save us from ourselves? I close my eyes and then I pray that revenge can be as sweet as it sounds. 
revels now are ended. And these, our actors, as I foretold you, are spirits and are melted into air, into thin air. And like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped mountains, the solemn temples, the glorious palaces, the great globe itself, yea, all which it inherits shall dissolve. Those scat-covered snowflakes are caught in the shit store. I found a cure for opioid addiction. What I didn't realize is that the opioid addiction is a $50 billion industry enriching the elites. There I was, my life's work stolen from me, betrayed by my own sister, shunned from society. All these years I've been planning my revenge against Avon Bard and all the world. I had Ariel infiltrate their boat and using gallons, gallons of whale laxative, lured them to their doom. How beauteous mankind is, oh brave new world that has such people in it. Tis I, Beckoning. I'm up and welcome to your final reckoning. <laughs> we are such stuff as dreams are made of, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. <laughs> Woo! Music is Live podcast. This is your host, Lou Mavs. Check out everything you need to know about the show over at musicislivepodcast.com. Welcome to my first brand new episode of 2022. And I'm very honored to have our special guest with us. He is a producer and performer in the realm of film, television, and music. I had the pleasure of meeting him at the 2016 New York Comic Con with the reigning and last truly independent film studio around New York's own Trauma Films. Since then, he's been working on his own music and can currently be seen on Shudder's The Last Drive-In with Joe Bob Briggs, where you can always catch him singing the praises of a film that Joe Bob himself humorously attempts to distance himself from. And that film is... Spookies! <laughs> hey! No, what? I thought you were going to oh, say no, Hogzilla! Oh, oh, shit, Hogzilla, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's right. so many that Joe Bob, uh, you know, he kind of like likes and doesn't like at the same time. But oh, yeah, of course, Hogzilla. But Hogzilla, I feel like that is going to grow over time. You know, I feel like we haven't heard the last of Hogzilla. And I believe Joe Bob's going to come around to it sooner or later. I just want to hear you do your Hogzilla chant. Oh, Hogzilla, 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 Hogzilla. Nice. <laughs> okay, I can't but- believe I failed the test. Oh, Christ. <laughs> Well, this isn't going to be outtakes. This is going to be on the episode. But that Beautiful. was, you know what? Perfect comic timing. So well, that I, was... I heard, well, I, Paul, I saw Paul McCartney in concert, right? And he messed up uh, the intro to one of his songs and he stopped and he started over. So if Paul McCartney is allowed to start over, I'm fucking fine. I'm fine with starting it right over. Let's do it. All right, fine. <laughs> then I'll put this in an outtake at the end then. Okay. No, no, you can put it in. No, I'll forget it. I'll no, no, no. <laughs> well, let's do it because I love outtakes. All right, so we'll, we'll try that again. Three, two, one. Where you can always catch him singing the praises of a film that Joe Bob himself humorously attempts to distance himself from. And that film is... Chud! <laughs> <laughs> Motherfucker just no, trolled me. I don't believe it. Okay. <laughs> All right, moving right along. His music was performed by Chris Jericho on the episode where they showed the 1970s grindhouse classic Blood Sucking Freaks. And you can catch his newest film, which will be premiering in April at the Museum of the Moving Image in Astoria, Queens. That film is hashtag Shakespeare Shitstorm. I got oh, that yeah. right, right? Yeah, yeah, Can't forget yeah, yeah. the hashtag. I'm very proud to have on the podcast with me, Long Island, New York's very own Mr. John Patrick Brennan. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. This is a pleasure. And uh, I, I, we ran into each other not too long ago at the Clutch show. We did. And that, that was that amazing? an amazing show. Oh, I loved it. The only thing is I've, I've seen them now 10 times. I still haven't seen them do Space Grass. That's like my favorite song by them. Uh, you know, they gave me Escape from the Plism Planet, all, all the classics except Space Grass. I was very happy to hear Texan Book of the Dead that night. So oh, yeah. that was pretty the, cool. It but, still was an amazing show. And the oh, opener, yeah. Stoner, 
So we basically saw two thirds of Caius. Which yeah. Is, oh my God. They were awesome too. I've been, I listened to them afterwards too. They're so good. Yep. I added them onto my Apple music as soon as I saw them. But the, the other opening act King Buffalo, I thought they were good too. Yeah. Clutch never has a disappointing opening act. I've seen them. Oh, God. Okay, so first time I saw them was 2000. The opening acts were 60 Watt Shaman and Corrosion of Conformity. And in 2001, it was Candiria. 2007. Was it the sword? No, I did not see the sword with Clutch. I saw the sword with Metallica at the oh, Nassau cool. Coliseum. Yeah, the sword, I saw. they opened up for Clutch maybe like three times when I saw it. I was sick. Uh, they're great. And the last time I saw them before this time was actually at the same venue at the Paramount in 2014. And American Sharks was the opening act. And they were pretty good, too. Cool. So, yeah, Clutch never has a dis- They never put on a bad show. They never have a bad opening act. Unfortunately, that was the last show of that tour because COVID. Boo! Yeah, totally. With Clutch, I just wish that they would do one tour where it's just them. And they give us a two and a half hour show with every single thing you want to hear, you know, because there's so many songs yeah. and they could do like a different set every night. You know, if they became the fish of stoner rock, that would be amazing. <laughs> but They're practically hey, the rush of stoner rock. You're right. They could do three hour sets. I mean, oh, they could. we're talking almost 30 years of music. I mean, yeah. they could do a whole two sets a night. But, you know, to sing like Neil Fallon does, I mean, that takes gotta so be much. Rough. I mean, the fact that he could still do it at this stage in his life. Great stuff. And, you know, yeah. I love the whole band. And the fact that it's still the same band, still the same lineup since the inception. Oh, yeah. You can't say that about many bands. No, and they are tight, tight oh, as yeah. fuck. Yeah, definitely. One of the best rhythm sections I ever heard. I love John Paul's drumming. Tim Salt, I find him to be a criminally underrated guitar player. Absolutely. That dude stands in one place the whole time and is, he's a riff machine. By the way, to all the detractors out there who say guitar players who use wah are not that good, listen and watch Tim Salt. He'll put all other players to shame how good he is with the wah. That's a great list band of mine to uh, get on the show, though. Doubt it. Anyways, but I'm so happy to have you here. So thanks for jumping on the call with me. So what in your formative years motivated you to pursue a career in in entertainment? Because, you know, you do music, you do film, you do television, you do acting. What was the impetus for that? Well, to pursue it, I mean, I always was doing, you know, making up stupid songs and like, you know, in sixth grade, I had a fake metal band called bloodshed and you know there was all these like things but it was never like a thought that it could be a career but then in like i want to say maybe junior or senior year of high school i I, um i quit football and i went out for the play and i got the second lead and on top of that my friends and i we had this hi8 camera and we were basically going out without even knowing it and doing performance art in malls And just like doing crazy things with crowds. And um, this was all before like the Tom Green show and stuff. And we were also doing skits at home. We would write these skits. And, you know, instead of like getting drunk every night, we would just sometimes be creative. And I started to think like, this is so fun. And people do this for a living. Maybe I can do this. So I decided, let me see if I could get into a film school and go for it. And I did. I got into a film school on Long Island, a CW Post Film School. And I, the reason I went there, not only because New York University wouldn't take me, but <laughs> because they, didn't they had take this, me either. Yeah, it was fucking elitist pigs. But they had a... Uh, Swine! <laughs> Sorry, I had to throw that out there. <laughs> this place had film. It was before digital, so I was cutting on flatbeds. I was shooting on Bolexes, all that sort of stuff. And they just had like a, not a lot of students, but a lot of equipment. And I like that. So I made some student films and stuff, but then in my senior year of college, I made a digital film. It was like the dawn of TV and that opened up my brain in a, in a million ways. And I made this thesis that was pretty fun. It was like a 25 minute shot on DV movie about the porn industry, about a guy who's obsessed with porn, who wants to have a threesome, but in, in, he basically like loses his girlfriend over it. It played pretty well at a couple of festivals. So I was like, this is it. I want to do this. So I went for it and I moved to LA and uh, failed for 10 years, came back to New York, got involved with trauma. And here we are today. <laughs> did your high school troop, did you guys have a name? We would call it um, skits, but it was like, we would spell it S K I T. Z and okay. it was like almost like we were schizophrenic it was like a whole ah. stupid thing it was like schizophrenic and the, you know because we would have a couple we had this superhero duo called lunatic boy and schizophrenic man and they were in a uh 
in an insane asylum and would solve crimes. And, okay. and you know, it was just like dumb, but we, you know, none, there was no production value. We would do it in my friend's apartment and stuff, but there was some funny, like everybody was a good performer and it was a lot of improv and it just was like a lot of fun to do. And that just cr- sparked my creative juices to continue on, you know, and people say you're not supposed to make art with your friends in the professional realm, but I totally disagree with that. Some of the best things I ever did was with my friends. A couple of months ago, I interviewed Carl Crew, who acted in the film Blood Diner. Yeah, oh, yeah. And he was telling me him and his castmates, Rick, they played the brothers in the film. They became such good friends from it. And it made the experience of being on a set like that, that much more fun, that much better for them. I've always advocated that, you know, like Lloyd Kaufman, get who you know and just have fun and If that's what you want to do, just do it. I don't like it when people go through the motions just to do it. It's like, you know, have fun doing it, whether it's writing a song, whether it's making a film or whether it's doing like a comedy sketch for YouTube. Yeah, I remember Kevin Smith said uh, it was it was an interview I read with him. And he said that the studio when he was making Mallrats is like, well, you're not you know, you can't just make movies with your friends. This is a professional thing. And it's like. Yeah, but if my friends are better than the professionals, what the fuck? Uh-huh. Do you like? <laughs> Some there of the funniest go. people, in, in fact, the funniest people I ever met were people who are not pursuing anything in the entertainment industry. They're just regular people who are funnier than anyone that you know who's mugging for the camera or any of that stuff. Because it's so, their character, it's their personality that shines just through. Just them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Look at me. I'm a doughy guy with a video audio podcast, but you know what? I. I, I, hey, look, I got to interview Sasha Gerstner from Halloween and I got to interview, you know, Masada, the wrestler. So, and they both. Halloween. Yeah. (laughs) Nice. You know, and they both told me what a great time that they had. Anyway, just do it. And that's why when I got to Troma, I loved the spirit of the place because it was all like, all right, we have a $20 million idea, but we're going to do it for like. $50. (laughs) $50. <laughs> I love it. It's great. Yeah. I mean, just make it happen. And they're aware of what they're doing and oh, it yeah. comes out so enjoyable. You know, I mean, I- I'm sorry. I'll take Surf Nazis Must Die over Ishtar any day of the week. You know what I mean? Although I do like some of Ishtar. There's that part uh, when he sings a uh, wardrobe of love in your eyes. Come on in and s- look around, see if there's something your size. What a what a lyric. <laughs> well, you know, I did mention Ishtar because that was the last movie that they did on Just the Cheese, Please, which you could also find on Rat Side Review. So shameless plug for Tara and Adam. Just the Cheese, Please, on the Rat Side Review Network. Whatever. Fuck you. All right, all right. I give love to my friends. I also, when I graduated college, I, I did a student film. I failed to copyright it. Now, this is oh. 2002. The name of the film was called The Korean Scotsman. Now, I realize in today's day and age of cancel culture and political correctness, that doesn't fly. But why? Because he's both Korean and Scottish? Well, no, because he's a Korean guy who got knocked on the head at a Scottish festival and woke up from it to think he was Scottish. It's not outside the realm of possibility. I mean, (laughs) yeah, but unfortunately, (laughs) six years later, Mars decided to release a Starburst commercial with a scotch korean man in it so we're talking about a Uh korean guy in a kilt and a bagpipe so i got no dog left in this fight anymore so i've completely abandoned any hopes do you really think the skittles people took the idea i don't know how it happened but you know (laughs) someone told me once they said if you come up with a good idea don't think someone else out there somewhere else Oh, somebody has it. It's the exact same idea that you have. They're working on it right now. That's why you have to be fast. You know how many things that I've thought of or were, was working on that I see all of a sudden a commercial? In college, I wrote a thing that it was about a bear trainer who gets his bear kidnapped and he goes ass kicking across the country to find it. And I was writing mine for Jean-Claude Van Damme. I wrote like five drafts of this things over the years, sent it out. People liked it, never got made. Pig comes along. It's Nicolas Cage. He gets his pig stolen. He goes basically on a revenge spree to go oh. get it. Who has my pig? So I'm like, ah, why, why did I wait this long to make this movie? So that's something that I learned is like, it doesn't matter. Just get the idea done, get it out, show it to as many people as possible. And if it gets made great, if it doesn't, you just got to make something else. So don't let them steal your pig <laughs> or your bear, so to speak. 
I like that. I like that. <laughs> Simultaneous creation is a real thing. That's why sometimes you hear a song and when people are crying like plagiarist, plagiarist, whatever. For Who was that a woman recently? Olivia Rodrigo, maybe? So she wrote a song. It's basically Pump It Up by Elvis Costello. It's the same music. But are even you Elvis serious? Cost- oh, you got to hear it. But Elvis Costello oh. came out and he's like, that's... He's like, I stole from people. So it's rock and roll. It's just the way it is. As long as it's not exact, if it's inspiration, that's fine. But you never know. Plagiarism, though, there is a thing where if you really do steal it, then it's pretty fucked up. Well, you know which song I actually thought really stole Pump It Up from Elvis Costello was The Escape Club's Wild Wild West. Yes. Okay. I could hear it, but see, it's not, it's, it's the feel. So, so it's a dangerous thing when um, blurred lines, right. Got, they lost their uh, lawsuit against the Marvin Gaye's estate because they, they said that they stole the feeling of got to give it up. And I think that that's dangerous because you, how could you copyright a feeling if it's note for note lifted? Yes, absolutely. But if it's a, if it's an homage you can't say that you can't do an homage to something. That's insane. Yeah. That's, thought, that's when you start to get into the brain police. I thought copyright law only applied to melodies and nothing more. Yeah, there's you know melodies, I mean? but they started to get into the minutia of the, the rhythm and the this and the that. And it's like, so all of a sudden, what, 4-4 four, four time is going to be copywritten by, uh, you know, like a, a Beatles? Like, you know, you can't do that. You need to be able to have elements of things that inspired you. And as long as it's not lifted wholesale, then I think it's fair. It's a shame that we'll never have another hip hop record like Paul's Boutique. Paul's Boutique is a masterclass in sampling, right? Mm -hmm. Nowadays, you try to use a sample, it's either too expensive or or somebody's gonna say no, and then you're just like, all right, whatever. But I feel like if you could take small clips and use them, that should be fair use. As long as it's not complete theft. I agree with that statement. I I definitely do. But, you know, we're living in this post Napster world where record labels are not what they were. The idea of sampling is so costly. Like you can't just take something and kind of recreate it and make your own. It's 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 a crazy way. It's a it's a new frontier. It's a new Wild West of all this stuff. So, you know, I'm not an advocate for like them changing laws behind it. Um, I say, you know what, people should just create and get it out there. And, you know, the money will come later. You know, sure. Just get it out there no matter what it is. I mean, look, I'm, I'm, I'm not the first to be doing something like this, you know, on YouTube and on audio streaming audio formats. I just try to be different just by being myself. Yeah. And I'm one who promotes creativity. Commerce yeah. is great, but get your shit out there. You're right. Exactly what you said about the film before. I can't believe M&M's and Starburst and uh, I uh. could have been sitting on a gold mine right now. Well, you but- know. Speaking of M&M's, Wait for it. you know, what's amazing is everybody people are in an uproar about the, the, the woman M&M getting the boots away less sexy. I don't know anything about what's going on with this M&M's thing. Can you please provide me the context? Well, basically, I mean, I don't know the full story, but I know that they they desexified one of the M&M's. Uh, but and people are flipping out. They're like, why are we taking away the, the-, the fucking candy? Why are you trying it's, to sexify it? Well, not only that, but that is a brilliant move by somebody in the M&M Corporation went, if we do this, it's going to spark a huge conversation online. And then all of a sudden it's free advertising for M&M. Aha! Aha! They didn't care about whether or not the M&M was sexy. They cared about getting people talking. So now people like... I don't know who's that guy on uh, uh, the news. Uh, Tucker Carlson. Uh, Tucker Carlson. He's like, God damn, they're taking away our sexy M and M's, and it's like free I, I, advertising. Genius, 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 genius. Fuck you, Malaka. Yeah. I hate politics. Thank politics you. Okay. To me, are the most boring subject in the world because even if you have a way to change, you're usually powerless. Even if you think that you can change it, the people at the top, right? They're so mm-hmm. rich, powerful, whatever that if they just decide like that to change everything on us, they can. Mm. So what the fuck? Just enjoy your life. Have some fun. Vote. Get out there and try to change things. But you have no power. Nobody does. Oh. <laughs> the lizard people have the goddamn power. <laughs>
No, it's the crab people. No, it's the, yeah, the crab people. Yeah. Look like crab, <laughs> taste like people. Sorry, random South Park reference. Don't sue me, Trade and Matt. It's a publicity stunt. You know, do you, when I was a kid. Well, it worked. <laughs> We're the, talking the, about it now. <laughs> there was a commercial where this little kid, there was two kids at a baseball game. This one kid was describing what each M&M would do for him uh, when he was up at bat. So he's like, a red is a single and brown is a double and the green is the home run. And the other mm-hmm. kid's like, can I have a green? And he's like, no, you could have the triple, which is the orange. So he gives the kid the orange, kid eats it, gets a triple. And then the other kid has the green and he's about to get a home run. That's not fraud. That is false advertising. That's marketing. But when they yeah. took away that marketing campaign, people weren't like, no, my children aren't going to get a home run. And I feel like that's <laughs> that's what would have happened. Are nowadays you kidding me? Them. No, no, no. It really. But. <laughs> They didn't really go in an uproar, but I feel like there's a section uh, of the world that would if that commercial was released nowadays. When I look for a good marketing campaign, I will support the product if the marketing campaign entertains me. But I didn't really think Wheaties was going to make me run faster. You know what I mean? It's like, come on. Yeah, but I did enjoy that Mikey liked Life Cereal, so I always supported Mikey. That's fine. I liked Kix Cereal. <laughs> Kix was good. I liked Kix too. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and now for something completely different what was the name of the film that you did that you uh, uh, it was called my dream of three-way I, uh, be- <laughs> <laughs> oh it's fucking brilliant and my- what was- <laughs> <laughs> and what was fun about it was so on the surface, and I, I wasn't chose expecting this. that. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it was a great. I, w- I would love to resurrect it someday. Um, but it, it what I shot it specifically on DV because it looked like the porn of the time. So I shot it like a porn on purpose and never showed anything lewd. Never showed. It was always like the scenes in between the sex scenes is what this movie looked like. And when I showed it at a uh, film festival, one of the other film students' mothers like he made a porno. Oh, won't somebody please think of the children? And I was like, good, I succeeded. This woman thinks I made a porn. It's so good. But the but the ultimate story was if you have love and a good person to support you and, and, and be in a relationship with you, don't give it up for these stupid fantasies because that's not real. Your fantasy isn't always a real thing and it could destroy you. Mm. It's not always what it don't be careful what you wish for is essentially right. what it is. No, I, I agree. I mean, I, I would love to see it. I, you know, it was online for a few years. And the problem was I used all popular music of the time because I at that time I wasn't thinking. So I have like Prince songs in there and it was up for like a month. And then Prince's people basically shut it down. Oh, my God. <laughs> you know what? Same thing happened to me. I did a Facebook live where I was playing guitar to like popular songs. And of course I picked Purple Rain. And the next thing I know, as soon as the live feed ended, it's like, your video has to be removed. It's like, why? Oh, yeah. Prince Prince doesn't play. You know, people sent me photos of them, like with their lighters in the air to uh, me doing the solo for Purple Rain. And like, oh man, you know, it's like, but at least I will always remember that they did that. So thank you out there to whoever did that. But, you know, I, I'd, cool. I'd still love to see it. But one day right. I'll, I'll, I'll get it on digital. Uh, I'll, digi- I'll digitize it, but not from the DV tape. I'll digitize it for the Internet age because I can't find that hard drive wherever it was. Very cool. So after you left L.A., you came back to New York and you ended up working for Troma. Yes. Now, here's the thing that I think that's cool that you could say that you work for Troma and were paid for it, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Because whenever I see a job opening on the Troma website, it always says position is unpaid. (laughs) (laughs) Well, so I started unpaid. I had just joined Twitter and one of the people I followed was Lloyd because I had remembered his movies. Uh, I watched them as a young person. And then I saw that like Father's Day was out around that time. And I was like, wow, that looks pretty cool. It's new trauma stuff. And also he was making Return to Newcomb High at the time. And I love the original Class of Newcomb High. In fact, Class of Newcomb High 2 was the first trauma movie I ever saw. So I was a big fan of the series. And he put out a tweet saying, we're looking for editing volunteers. And at the time I had gotten pretty decent at editing and I had made a few music videos and stuff like that. I worked on a public access TV show. And did like, I don't know, 15 half hour episodes. So I was rocking and rolling at the time, sent in my work, got a quick interview and got hired, hired essentially to do Lloyd's make your own damn movie YouTube lessons. It wasn't for the series. It was for he had a channel 
and he would still shoot the make your own damn movie lessons. So I did a couple of those and Lloyd really liked them. So he started giving me more stuff. And also Matt Mangerides at, at the time, he's the producer of The Last Drive-In with Joe Bob Briggs, along with Justin Martell, both trauma guys. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of how I got trauma. But Matt would then start to give me editing assignments like trailers. I edited and directed and wrote a, a, a feature length compilation called Horror Boobs, which was the best <laughs> breast scenes in trauma history. <laughs> and the Horror Boobs was invented by a guy named Matt Desiderio from New York. And his company is Horror Boobs. And they were supposed to collaborate. Somehow I got involved and got the gig and just did it. So that was a really huge learning experience, getting to do basically a whole feature. And I still wasn't getting paid at the time. So then they were trying to up their YouTube game. And I pitched the show Kabuki Man's Cocktail Corner. With Doug Sackman as... With Doug Sackman. He was the guy in Troma's Edge TV getting arrested in Sundance. Oh, my <laughs> God. I, Man. I still remember him from All the Love You Can. And all the, the love shit you can. he stirred. And, Classic. Classic. You know, shit. just literally peeing in the sales agent's briefcase. I'll never forget that scene. I was yeah, like, it, God, that took balls, no pun intended. <laughs> yeah, and, and that stuff, again, was like kind of all before Jackass. It was like something was going on at the time where that sort of like too extreme for reality thing was like really popular in the zeitgeist and, and trauma was in on the, the first wave of that. And so I always remembered Sackman's performance as Kabuki Man. So I said, let's bring Doug Sackman back have him be like a drunken talk show host waiting for his sequel. And uh, he'll just like talk to independent artists and musicians and stuff like that. So we ended up doing 10 episodes and then five specials and then one hour long special. So we have a lot of content for Kabuki Man's Cocktail Corner. But that's what basically got Lloyd convinced that I was for real. A lot of people go to Troma and they say, I'm going to do this, that, the other thing. And then they never do anything. Because all they want to do is direct the Toxic Adventure Part 5. You know, it's like, yeah, like, let's get real. You know, Lloyd was losing his assistant at the time for some reason or another. And he asked me to be his assistant and I kind of didn't want to do it. And then it, but he convinced me by saying it's going to be a great collaboration as well. So you're not just going to be an assistant. You'll be producing the movies and this and that. And so that convinced me to say. Yeah, I do want to produce a Troma movie. I want to see what it's like to really get in the, in the weeds and, and work and see what it's like to do it for zero dollars. <laughs> I'm happy to say that I was a trauma intern at one oh, point. Oh, oh. Well, they call them observer. Production assistant. Now. Yeah, there you go. Production assistant. <laughs> right. And they call the extras actor persons. Actor persons. Yep. And of it's course, very... the, the three rules of production. Safety to humans. Safety to humans property. In lowercase letters, make a good movie. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Those are the three rules. And I remember pretty, that very well. Pretty perfect it's perfect to live by uh, on a set so i was when were you uh pa summer of 1998 pre-production oh. for terror firmer terror firmer what we got here is your basic serial killer you know your killer's choices of victims yeah. indicate some sort of personal animosity against you and your company family values must be saved yeah right <laughs> <laughs> So that's the classic era. I mean, it's right after Tromeo. They were still in New the, York City the proper. Hell's Kitchen. Yeah, they were yeah. still in the Hell's Kitchen office. Yeah. And I had to report to the production office, which was across the street from the Troma building. I got to meet Will Keenan. I got mm. to meet a bunch of people. Yaniv Sharon, actually, we were both PAs together. Yaniv, cool. I'm very proud of his accomplishments. You know, he went on to do a lot of great stuff. I didn't last because... I didn't realize how intense it was going to be. Um, oh, again, intense. I was 17 years old. I was working part time at Lecter's on Steinway Street in Astoria to make money to buy books for college. So when Lloyd said the, the production is going to be for the month of August in Brooklyn, everyone has to be there every day. 
And I knew I couldn't commit to it. So I said, you know what? I got to go. I can't do this because yeah. I did not realize that being on a production of this magnitude and look, you could say what you want about trauma films. You could say, oh, it's low grade B, Z, horror. Flick. No, you know what it is? It's real film school because it prepares you. School. Yeah, mm-hmm. it prepares you for the realities of it. OK, it's not. You know, the craft services table has like, you know, shrimp cocktail and this and that. It's like, no, (laughs) if you're making a film, it's the best film school. I'll even say that. I wasn't ready for it. But what I not a lot of people can because you you need to make a living somehow. But if you can swing it, then it's great. Right. And I will I will say this. I was grateful for what I did learn when I was there because everybody was hustling like mad people. Yeah. Just to make this film. I watched Terra Firmer to this day, and I'm proud of what everyone did. Yeah. I think it's one of the best trauma films that they oh, ever done. I, I love it. I, I absolutely love it. And so Lloyd always says, we don't take ourselves seriously, but we take our movies seriously. And he does. I mean, he he always has um, something to think about in the movies, even though it's filled with nudity, gore, comedy, all that stuff. Underneath, there's a theme or there's a lesson that Lloyd has been thinking about for many years, and he gets that across in interesting ways. And I think a lot of directors have abandoned the theme in movies. It's just like, oh, we're going to make this that go thing and happen, and there's no reason or rhyme for it. And Lloyd is still hammering home uh, many, many themes. The last movie we did, Shakespeare's Shitstorm, brought it back to New York City proper for the first time since Terra Firmer, and it's all about anti-Big Pharma and anti-cancel culture. So it's a really big theme for everything that's going on today. Not a lot of people will agree with the sentiment, but I think Lloyd Kaufman, after 50 years of feature filmmaking and 48 years of trauma, has earned his say. And you can't just boil it down to the stupid theme of old man yells at cloud. You have to take him into consideration because say what you will about the film, say what you will about whatever. No one has done what Lloyd and Troma and Michael Hers have done for that amount of time and to keep their vision intact for all that time. I mean, hey, they probably had rocky times. They probably didn't make the money that they could have in certain ways, but they took things like The Toxic Avenger and made it a, a cartoon for kids. And it was a success, you know, all that sort of thing. So they have done so much. They are a very important thing or entity in movie history. And I believe in the fairness and fullness of time that that will continue to uh, grow. I agree with you. And the fact that they are the oldest independent, even if it's not independent, well, oldest Lloyd, film studio uh, to still be in New York. Yeah, Lloyd, he's very big on like minutia of certain words and stuff. He likes to say longest running. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I didn't oldest. realize oldest was an insult. <laughs> I don't know if it's an insult, but he likes to correct the verbiage sometimes. That's fine. That's fine. I do notice that he likes to repeat a lot of the same sentiments, such as trauma is Latin for excellence in celluloid. And isn't that so funny? I love that so much. That is such a clever, stupid thing to say. But you know what drives me nuts, though, is that does anyone not do their homework in interviewing (laughs) Lloyd Kaufman? It's like some do not. Some absolutely do not. Some people just are, are like, so what do you do? And yeah. it's like, <laughs> what? You're talking to Lloyd Kaufman, man. There's 50 years of experience there. You can ask him anything. So you're one of the few people I know of whose talents include acting, composing, directing, producing, and writing. Uh, a lot of people usually stick to one thing that works, but I think you run the gamut of being an independent jack of all trades. How important is it for you to be involved in all these aspects of creativity? And do you think it's something that anyone who wants to break out into the line of work that you do, do you think it's something that they should do their due diligence to follow that similar path? Or is this something that you would say, no, you did this because you wanted to do it? Well, for me, it was out of necessity because I wasn't necessarily getting the opportunities that I wanted for certain things. I went out to LA to be a writer. I wrote a dozen screenplays. I didn't sell anything. So, I mean, I had meetings and stuff, but I never sold anything. So I started to get into the mindset, like my father said, oh, you should just go out and network and just work on a movie set anyway. So, and at first I was like, "Ah, I don't want to do that. And then when I went to Troma, I said, you know what? I'm going to do anything, anything these people throw at me. And that's what sort of helped me not only expand my knowledge, expand my network. And even though I was giving myself away for free, the the learning experience was so valuable to me. So everybody's different. I can't say that everybody should take the same path as me. But what I will say is if you get an opportunity and it doesn't feel bad, it feels 
okay, like you think you can handle it and it's not for a long time or whatever, do it. Just see what happens because worst case scenario, you could be honest with people and say, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> and usually people respect that. They respect that more than if you stay for a very long time and are miserable and screw things up. I would say if you're an aspiring artist out there, there's no shame in giving yourself away for free and trying a bunch of different things because you might find something that you're good at that you didn't know you'd be good at. And I'm not saying I'm good at producing, but what I'm saying is that's the, the role that Lloyd sort of pushed me into. And I rose to the occasion and I got to produce two feature films. I couldn't have paid New York University enough money you know, like uh, it, to, to give me the knowledge that Lloyd gave me over the course of four years. These sorts of things will lead to experiences that will then be beneficial to you for the rest of your career. So do everything, but do everything within how it feels to you. Like go by your gut, because usually your gut is right. If it's a bad situation, get out of it. If it's a good situation, stay and try it out. What I love about the stuff that you've done and, you know, I've seen some of the, I've seen a Kabuki Men's Cocktail Corner and, and I loved it. Obviously, I love Return to Nukem High, a.k.a. Volume 1 and Return to Return to Nukem High, a.k.a. Volume 2. Love yep. them both. I saw you in them. I'm like, I know that guy. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> See, that's another. So, for example, Return to Return to Nukem High, a.k.a. Volume 2. When I first started on that movie, I was just writing a song. I wasn't producing it. They had a shoot and I went just to be like a PA or whatever. And one of the actors failed to tell people about his schedule so he had to leave and there was all these lines and lloyd's like well who the fuck is gonna do these lines and then he goes you he goes you could do it you could just put on your brooklyn accent and go boss 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 we got a problem we're out of gas what about this gas bag Ugh. this tank is empty jumping jesus on a pogo stick call for my rickshaw I, I gotta get to the school and get some fresh meat yes sir and I said, okay, <laughs> yeah. So they threw me into a hazmat suit. I learned, uh, you know, two scenes and I did it. And that that's a, a perfect example of, I was just there. So I got the roles, uh, you know, I wasn't tra planning on it. It just happened. So that opportunity, now I have that. If I really want to go and put an acting reel together, I have a scene with Lloyd Kaufman. One of the things, though, that upset me about volume two, you never find out who Deep Throat is. Ah, uh, there's some but theory. <laughs> But I did do the Kickstarter for volume two. So I know who Deep Throat is. But I'm oh. not snitching. You son of a bitch. Boo, boo, fucking who? Okay. All right. Because there needs to be a little mystery. Exactly. Besides, continuity is not one of Troma's best attributes, and you have to accept that. Not one to use the C word, huh? What? Continuity. What you talking about? None of these shots will match. I don't think anyone's gonna notice. And that's why you work here. Fuck you. But yeah, I mean, look. Um, it's part of the volume, charm, though, I think. Volume 2 is an interesting piece of work because it's Lloyd's mind... I think on screen, Roy Frumkis, who wrote Street Trash, yes. he saw it and he said it's the feature length version of the Odessa Steps from that Eisenstein movie, the old Russian, you know, when the baby carriage is falling down the thing. And what he meant by that is like the whole movie is just editing and ideas. And even if the idea doesn't work, it presents it to you and it moves, 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 and it just moves on. So there's no works. way to get, and it works. There's no way that you could possibly get bored of that movie. You could poke holes in the plot. You could say this didn't work, that didn't work. But if you're bored, wait for it. There's something, There's something wrong, with wrong with you. Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So and, and and that, that was not that was not queued up. Okay. No. That was that, again simultaneous what? Creation. Simultaneous, simultaneous creation. creation. There you go. Yeah. It does exist. It's and, been and, proven right now on the Music is Life and, podcast. Exactly. And look, I produced Return to Newcomb High Volume 2, but I would love to see a super cut of one and two together, almost like Quentin Tarantino was going to do the whole bloody affair for Kill Bill One and Two and just make it one thing. Nice. I think that Return to Newcomb High deserves that treatment just to see how it would be as one linear story we'll see very cool well as i was saying i did contribute to the kickstarter campaign for volume two i got a copy of the original script as a pdf lloyd sent me a copy of the blu-ray which again i have to thank you for because i changed addresses and you made oh, sure that yeah. i got it so thank you i got my name in the credits so 
Yes. You know, bucket <laughs> list. Yeah, that's very cool. And you know what? That What an experience that was. It was a masterclass. They had already shot a lot of footage, but there were all these holes that needed to be filled and they had no budget. There was no budget. Like, I mean, literally zero dollars to make this stuff. So we had to get inventive. And even though it sucked that we had to shoot on DSLRs and stuff and, and juxtapose it with Alexa footage, nobody does that except Lloyd. But we got creative and we used the things that we had available to us. And we finished that movie by hook or by crook. Lloyd and Troma had enough YouTube followers that we could get free days at the YouTube studio in Manhattan. Beautiful production space. So we utilized that, you know? Then we utilized the trauma basement and made it seem like it was the basement of the high school. And st- all these little things. We found this abandoned building that had this great bed bug sign out. So, so we did a scene in front of that, you know? Mm-hmm. So it was all these little things to put together to finish that movie. I think they are visually the two best looking trauma films that wait I've ever you seen. see Shakespeare's shitstorm. The I whole can't thing. wait. No, I cannot wait for no that. DSLR all shot on red, shot by Lucas Patassi. And he did an amazing job making it look crisp, beautiful. It looks big. It looks big. It almost looks like it's parts of it that look like Disney does trauma. The quality of the trailer itself looks amazing. I think we're going to be in for a really good surprise with hashtag Shakespeare shitstorm. Man, that's a tongue twister. Uh, <laughs> it is. It is. It's hard. But hey, that's Lloyd's creative choice. And I back it. Let him do what he wants. Definitely. Okay.